दादर चरण वेलकम अजीब अली साहब वेलकम एंड वेलकम डॉक्टर ताबिर कलाम साहब एंड इट इज रियली ए वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक ऑन विच यू आर गोइंग टू डिलीवर योर लेक्चर हाउ दी प्रोविंसियल उट वेस्टिंग टाइम आई शुड से दैट बिकॉज द लेक्चर इज वेरी लेंदी कवरिंग सो मेनी थिंग्स ऑलमोस्ट मोर देन एटी स्लाइड्स आर देयर तो इट वुड बी बेटर इफ यू If we request uh, Azim Ali Sahab to kindly start the lecture. Welcome, sir, and please, please start your lecture. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about. Uh, uh, sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the coins of uh, late uh, medieval India, from the Tughlaqs to the Gujarat Sultanate. So just going to give a uh, brief uh, recap from from my previous lecture. So um, I've looked at Islamic coinage and how it emerged in India after the. Arab conquest in Sindh in 711 AD, and uh, these coins primarily consisted of small silver coinage known as damas. And uh, these damas were in circulation for a while until um, these coins were in circulation for a while until the arrival of the dirhams and dinars under Mahmud of Ghazni, and the Ghaznavids, which was a dynasty established by Mahmud of Ghazni, uh, would be succeeded by the Ghurids. Who establish a permanent uh, Muslim presence east of Punjab, and under their successors, the Delhi Sultanate, uh, Islamic coin has spread down the Ganga Valley up to Bengal, and uh, this kind of paved the way for the diverse range of Islamic coinage which would emerge in India following the collapse of the Tughlaq dynasty in the 14th century AD. And now I'm going to look at because uh, uh, at the end of my last lecture I left off at the end of the the Kilgis and the rise of the Tughlaqs. So I'm going to be talking about the first Tughlaq Sultan of Delhi, uh, Giyasuddin Tughlaq, and here's his tomb in Tughlaqabad in Delhi, which you can see today. One of the most kind of beautiful uh, tombs or mausoleums from the Delhi Sultanate. And um, so Giyasuddin took look, came to power as Sultan in uh, 1320 after overthrowing the Kilji dynasty, and uh, his army included uh, quite a few kind of non-Muslim uh, groups, uh, such as the Kokas in Punjab and the Mayors of Haryana, um, who both supported him. And after becoming Sultan, he set out to establish his authority in Punjab and Sindh, and uh, in the south of India. He in 1323 he conquered Warangal, which uh, which basically ended the uh, the Kakatiya dynasty of, for the first time, um, for the final time, removing them as a threat in the south of India. But his kind of most notable and visible legacy today is the construction of Tughlaqabad Fort in Delhi, as I mentioned before. And um, and by 1325, um, Giyasuddin. Um, after building the fort, um, he ruled on until 1325, and he died in an accident when his wooden pavilion uh, collapsed on him. And he was succeeded by his son Muhammad bin Tughlaq. And uh, Giyas Giyasuddin Tughlaq's uh, coins were kind of continued from the fort. So he struck bilinganis, which are small bronze coins, and he also struck copper pekas. And um, These coins had Arabic inscriptions on the obverse and reverse, and on the obverse, there's the following Arabic inscription: Al Sultan Al Ghazi, which means the Sultan, the Holy Warrior, and then the reverse reads 
Giyath al dunya wa al din, which means uh, one who seeks for help from the world and the faith. And this is one of the copper bakers uh, from uh, Marada Arts, which is owned by a friend of mine who runs an auction house in ba uh, Bangalore. Uh, so this is a small copper baker struck by Gyasuddin Tukluk, probably struck in Delhi, I'd imagine, as that was the center of his empire. And now I'm going to look at Muhammad bin Tukluk, um, under whom the Delhi Sultanate kind of reaches greater, greatest extent, so it stretched from Punjab, uh, almost touching the, the Bataan areas, sporting Afghanistan, down to Bengal, uh, westwards into Gujarat, parts of Sindh, and south right down into almost kind of touching kind of Karnataka and almost touching kind of Tamil Nadu as well. So uh, Muhammad bin Tukluk acceded to the throne of Delhi, Sultanate in 1325. And it was under him that the Delhi Sultanate reached its territorial peak. And uh, he's remembered for uh, organizing an efficient revenue system, which helped consolidate and organize the royal treasury. And this uh, policy was part of a broad centralization of power. But the centralization of power kind of caused resentment. And there were revolts in the south of India, in the Deccan and Sindh from 1326 to 1328. And there was also a revolt in Bengal, which has always, had always been a, uh, you know, a difficult province to govern by the Delhi Sultanate, and they again tried to secede from the Delhi Sultanate. And uh, Muhammad bin Tughluq, um, something he's he did something which is he's also remembered for um, in in Indian history. He controversially moved the capital of the Delhi Sultanate from Delhi to Diogiri in Maharashtra, and he refounded Diogiri as Dolotabad, where he also set up a mint. And um, these kind of bold political moves, kind of dislocating the government and moving the capital, create, again created a lot of resentment, and there were more revolts, at this time from his nobility. And there were also revolts in the Ganga Yamna Doab, just near to Delhi, and there was actually food shortages as a result. And then on the Konkan coast, on the western part of India, and in Punjab, there were also rebellions, and a successful rebellion in Kampila, in the south of India, uh, paved the way for the emergence of the kingdom of Vijayanagar. So you have, a, so the picture you have is kind of a sultanate, although it's very big, it's constantly racked by rebellions, and you start seeing the fragmentation of Delhi Sultanate, even during what is considered to be the, the peak of the Delhi Sultanate. And in response to these threats to his power, he, he tried to kind of gain legitimacy in the eyes of Muslim subjects by seeking the approval of the Abbasid Caliph, um, who, who by this time was exiled in Cairo. But uh, these attempts to use religion to rally support for the Tughluq dynasty failed. And in response, he tried to centralize the management of the provinces in Gujarat and the Deccan in the south of India, kind of bring it under his control, but this led to further resentment and rebellion. And in the Deccan, the, the Bahmani Sultanate uh, would, would emerge out of these uprisings by 1347. And by that time, it was clear that Day's Sultanate was starting to splinter, as the Lotabad in Maharashtra was also lost to the Bahmani Sultanate. And it was during these kind of campaigns to try to restore order to the Day Sultanate in, um, he, he first campaigned in Gujarat during the last 30 years of his life, and then Muhammad <laughs> He also spent, uh, and then by the end of his life, he was in, he'd moved to Tata in Sindh, where he caught, uh, he fell ill and died. And um, he was succeeded by uh, Farosh Atokluk, his cousin. And uh, Muhammad Min Tukluk is very famous in India for his experiments in minting coins and, um, and how he kind of meddled with the coinage and created a lot of economic disruption in India. So, in, is, in addition to Bilindanis, copper pakers, and gold tankers, uh, Muhammad bin Tughluq struck his famous uh, copper tankers to fund his army and public works. But um, these, this was a disaster, as um, according to local accounts, um, it, almost every house across India were actually minting coins because they were so easy to counterfeit, and basically the, the coinage became worthless. And um, the obverse of these coins read in Arabic, Al Wala al Sultan, al Akal al Nas be Azam Tukluk, 
which means um, if there was no sultan, verily the people would devour one another. Tabluk. And the reverse reads in Arabic, al tawa Allah wa al tawa al Rasul wa al Ali, which means obey God and the Prophet. Uh, and uh, may, I, may I have it, an intervention with your permission? Yeah. Uh, Professor Tabir Kalam has joined. Okay. He's a professor of medieval history, uh, and I hello. welcome him. And because of some very compressing uh, engagements, he would be joining somewhere. So uh, I would request him to to say something. And although he has to chair the today's talk, but because he has to leave, so I request him to give something like pronouncements about the the, the talk. And he is an expert, so he would be sharing his views, and then you would proceed. Okay. So, uh, I request Professor Kalam to please come up with... Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, myself, Tafir Kalam. I am teaching medieval Indian history in the Department of History, Banaras Hindu University. Uh, respected Professor Rakesh Pandey and Dr. Azim Ali. Uh, and I, I, I am uh, unfortunate to not listen your lecture directly. But uh, today morning I uh, went through with your lecture on YouTube and I came to know about something uh, uh, what you have said about the medieval coins. Uh, basically I am a uh, uh, medievalist because that I was interested in medieval coins only. And uh, that is a very uh, good area uh, for the study of numismatics. And uh, I don't know much about it because I have done my research on the basis of the text, the Persian text and the text. So I don't know much, but I have read something. And I know Aziza Hassan, she was the pioneer of the medieval coins. She did something. Nowadays, Najah Fajr is there. He, is, he was my teacher and he was, he, is, uh, my, he was my senior to me. And he did his uh, research on the coins and economic system of the medieval India. And uh, you might be knowing Najah Fajr. And Danish Moeen, uh, he is my, he is also my senior. He is working at uh, Manu, Manu Azad National Urdu University. And uh, once I was listening to him in a seminar, and he was uh, telling uh, uh, about the coin, and that was the name. Uh, that was coin of the Akbar, and the name of the coin. Uh, sorry, the, on the coin it was uh, written uh, Ya Moeen. And that was a new for me because Yamoin, Yamoin, that was related to Moedin Chishti. And oh, yes. then he told the entire story that how Akbar was uh, very eager to get child and he went to the Ajmer and after that he got his child and that was Salim and the name of the child was uh, put on the name of the uh, Salim Chishti. And Salim Chishti was from the Chishtiya Silsala and because of that he uh, and at that time, that point of time, he stuck a coin. He ordered to stack a coin that was, uh, the, uh, and it was written Yamoi. So that is also related to Sufism. That was very unique for me. And uh, recently, uh, in India, the Shiraz of the Hindu book that was, uh, that is came by Ajaz Hussain on Turkey dynasty. And that is on the basis of the coins. <laughs> So I know these details about the coins and something about the medieval coins only. But uh, when I uh, listen your lecture, that was very fascinating to me and uh, I will love to listen again and again. And I will try to join your lecture and if I will not get it. Then what I will do that I will go to the uh, YouTube because my department has put your lecture on the YouTube. So uh, you are most welcome and I am very thankful to you that you are uh, sharing your views and your uh, expertise with uh, our students and our colleagues, and I am I am all I am also a beneficiary. So uh, I have to share this session. I am not able to share because I have to go somewhere. And uh, best of luck for you, and thank you very much. And uh, uh, we will keep in touch regarding the medieval Indian history and medieval Indian coins. I will learn something from you because I don't know much about. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank, thank you, sir. Pandey, sir, thank you very much for thank giving me this much. opportunity thank you very to much. Uh, become a part of this uh, lecture series. It, it's really very encouraging that you joined it and 
give something like an initial remarks yes sir you, we had been listening to you and we have been listening to you so yes i think your statements and your sayings are something like an, an encouragement yes sir the whole process so thank you very much for okay welcome sir welcome sir okay sir i take your leave sir bye sir okay. Uh, and now I request uh, Dr. Azim Ali Sahab to please begin with to start uh, from where he left and please okay. continue his lecture. Yes. So saying um, for um, so the reverse of these coins, I've actually had one in front of me, a copper patanka struck by Mahbin Tukluk. Um, the reverse says uh, Al Tewa, Allah wa Al Tewa. Al Rasul wa Al Wali, which means obey God and the Prophet and those in authority among you. And the reverse on these coins um, may have actually been intended to deter counterfeiters, as well as a reaction to the numerous rebellions and revolts that were happening across the Delhi Sultanate. And here is um, this is a half tanka of Mahabin Tughluq, kind of following the same kind of model as the full tankas, like this. This was struck um, probably in Delhi, but we don't know because the mint is not there. And um, so you can see that it's very kind of low-grade copper rather than silver. And uh, the full tankas, which I had shown, they were struck in uh, Arabic and Persian by Imam bin Tugluk, uh, often in the Lotabad, where he set up his capital and mint. And the obverse reads in Arabic, Min ata al Sultan Fakad, Allah al Rahman, which means uh, he who obeys the Sultan obeys the merciful one, uh, meaning God in this case. And the reverse reads in Persian, Mohoshot Tanko Pancho Gani, Ta Rozga Bonda Bonde Amiva Muhammad Tukluk, which means sealed as a tanka of fifty Gani which is um, basically uh, one tanka made 50 gani in the denomination system in the Delhi Sultanate. In the reign of the slave, hopeful of divine mercy, Muhammad Tukluk. And around the margins of uh, this coin in, uh, is the following inscriptions in Persian. Da takta dalotabad salba hafsad sedo, which means struck in the capital dalotabad, in uh, the Hijri year of 732, which is uh, 1332 AD. And here is actually one of the, um, the copper tankers of Mahab Ben Tukluk, uh, struck in the Lotabad in 732 Hijri, which is 1332 AD. And uh, Mahab Ben Tukluk also struck uh, copper and brass durams, um, which had the Arabic and Nagari script, on the obverse and Persian on the reverse. And the obverse reads in Arabic and Nagari scripts, Mahabin Tukluk. And the reverse reads in Persian, Sike, uh, Zad, Jaiz, Da, Ad, Bande, Amidva, Mohammed Tukluk. Which means uh, this coin was minted and permitted in the time of the slave, hopeful of divine mercy, Mohammed Tukluk. And this is one of the uh, coins made out of brass or copper struck by Muhammad bin Tukluk. Uh, the mint isn't given, but we can be sure that it was minted between 1325 and 1351 AD. And now I'm going to move on to uh, Farusha Tukluk, uh, Muhammad bin Tukluk's uh, cousin, who succeeded him. Um, so he, he had been a commander of 12,000 horses and had a lot of experience uh, crushing rebellions and fighting around India. And he, he was already quite uh, experienced and old by this time. He was in his early 40s. And um, in order to ensure stability, he inherited a lot of his nobility from Mahmoud Tukluk's government. And they were kind of uh, placated or pleased by given, because um, they were given a, a lot of land. And um, the Sultan kind of kind of drew, drew back some of the centralization that happened before. And um, this had the unintended and the consequence of a lot of the revenue that was collected from the land holdings of his nobility um, actually kept a lot of that revenue. And there wasn't much record, being, um, like it wasn't being audited correctly by the government. So there was actually a decline in revenue from his government. 
as well from from his nobility land holdings and at the same time he had to also kind of pay a larger salary to his officers to kind of keep the peace so that they wouldn't rebel against him but uh, by doing all these things by decentralizing power and trying to pay off his supporters he actually inadvertently kind of strengthened the forces which were already starting to break up the Delhi Sultanate by making the nobility very powerful and also despite being you know despite having fought uh, you know, with 12,000 horses and campaigning around, he actually wasn't a very good general, unfortunately. And um, when he fought in, against Bengal, he, he was unable to really press his uh, advantage that he had when he fought there in 1353 and 1359. And um, his only success during his reign was the conquest of uh, Nagakot in, in the Kangra Valley in Himachal Pradesh in 1364. And in 1365, he launched a disastrous expedition to Sindh, where his army kind of got lost and supplies ran out. But uh, his main kind of legacy, which can be seen today, um, is uh, is that of Ferocia Kotla in Delhi, which uh, some of you may know has a famous cricket ground, which is still where a lot of uh, cricket matches still play today in Delhi. And the fort can still be seen today. And he also founded the cities of Hisar in Haryana, which some of you may know. And um, the full name is actually Hisar e Feroz, which means Fort of Feroz. And also, he also founded the city of Jompur in Uttar Pradesh, which is um, in about an hour, hour and a half drive from uh, from Varanasi. And um, after this kind of difficult reign, he he would pass away in 1388. So despite kind of being very militarily and politically not very competent, at least architecturally, you know, he, he did leave a legacy. But by 38, he unfortunately caught an illness and died. And here is uh, Frosha Kotla in Delhi, which some of you may have visited. I, I believe it's close to the Yamna River. And uh, Frosha Kotla also struck... Um, silver and gold tankers, as his predecessors had done. And he also struck uh, double jittles with Persian and Arabic inscriptions on them. And on the verse, it reads in Persian, Ferocia Sultani, which means Ferocia Sultan. And the reverse reads in Arabic, Da al Mulk Delhi, which means uh, in the kingdom of Delhi. And this is one of the small... Um, they're double jitters, but they're quite small. Uh, this was struck by Frosha Tukluk between 1351 and 1388 AD in Delhi. And after Frosha Tukluk's death, and, um, he was followed by a succession of weak rulers. And the most, theory, uh, the most serious threat sorry, faced by the late Tukluks was the invasion of India by Amir Timur, who is also remembered as uh, Timur Lang in India. And uh, Timur was a Turko-Mongol warlord who had come to power in 1370. And by 1398, which is the year when he invaded India, he already ruled much of Iran and Central Asia. And he was a member of the Balas tribe and claimed the title of Sahib Kiran, which means uh, the Lord of the Fortunate Conjunction, which is an astrological term. And uh, Sahib Kiran uh, would reappear as a title used by the Mughals two centuries later because they wanted to link themselves with their ancestor, Timur. And by the time of Timur's invasion in 1398, the Delhi Sultan's military strength had been weakened a lot due to a loss in financial revenue from the provinces, a legacy of Ferocia Tukluk's uh, rule. And um, when he invaded, the Tukluks were able to field just 12,000 cal cavalry, 40,000 infantry, and 120 elephants to face Timur's army. And this meant that when Timur invaded, it was a complete and utter disaster for the Tukluks. And the army was defeated, and Delhi was sacked and pillaged. And um, from then on, until 1405, the Timurid Empire, which was founded by Timur, would uh, would briefly extend from Iran to India. But um, And by 1414, the Tukluk dynasty would come to an end with the accession to the throne of Kizr Khan, the first ruler of the Sayyid dynasty. And um, the decline in Tukluk fortunes is reflected in the coinage, but um, in the sense that they're kind of, um, they still kind of can try to mint gold tankers despite the decline. But again, it followed the same motives as before. So kind of Arabic and Persian inscriptions uh, struck, for example, this I'm talk 
this example being struck by Muhammad bin Farouz, uh, son of Farouz Atukluk, uh, between 1390 and 1393. And on the verse it reads, um, Al Sultan Al Azam, Muhammad Shah Farouz Shah Sultani Kulidat Mamla Katuhu, which means the great Sultan Muhammad Shah, son of Farouz Shah, may God prolong his kingdom. And the reverse reads, um, Fi zaman al imam, ame al muminin kulidat kilafatu, which means uh, in the time of the imam, commander of the faithful, may God prolong his caliphate. And here's one of the gold uh, dunkers struck by uh, Muhammad bin Farouz of the Tughlaq dynasty, um, struck between in uh, 793 Hijri, which is 1390 to 1391 AD. So not long before Timur's invasion. Of India. And uh, this was the Timurid Empire at its maximum extent, so it stretched from uh, Turkey, so Sivas in Turkey, Aleppo in Syria in the west, uh, north to Central Asia, and down into the Persian Gulf, Arabian Sea, and eastwards into India, into Punjab, and right up to Delhi. And um, the conquest of Delhi by Timur also marked the arrival of Timurid coinage in North India for the first time. And these coins actually form a precursor of early Mughal coinage, which would will, which will be known as Sharukis later on. And the Mughals did this deliberately because they wanted to stylize themselves as Timurids ruling in India. And uh, Tamerlane, which is not a name for Timur, his coinage was struck, um, his coinage was struck in the name of the Mongol uh, Chagatai Khan, Mahmud Khan in Central Asia. And the Chagatay Khanate was one of the successor states of the Mongol Empire following its fragmentation after Genghis Khan's death. And uh, Timur couldn't claim to be Khan of the Mongols as he wasn't descended from Genghis Khan. Instead, uh, Timur married the daughter of the Chagatay Khan and stylized himself as Gur Khan, which means son-in-law of the Khan. And that's why his descendants, the Mughals, when they ruled India, were actually known as Gur Khani in Persian because they, they still considered themselves to be the son-in-laws of the, uh, the Mongol Khans and Timur's kind of silver tankers um, include, often include the following inscriptions in Arabic Al Sultan Mahmud Khan Timur Gul Khan Kulidat Allah Mulkahu which means struck in the name of the Sultan Mahmud Khan Timur son in law of the Khan may God prolong his rule and here is um, Here's one of the dunkers uh, struck by Timo in uh, Bitlis, which is today in Turkey. And now, um, after looking at the, the destruction of the Tughluqs and Timo's invasion, we're going to look at the Sayyid dynasty. And this is the tomb of one of the Sayyid kings, uh, Muhammad Shah, in the Lodi Gardens in Delhi, which can be seen today. So we're going to look at Kizar Khan, the founder of the Sayyid dynasty. Um, he was a Sayyid, or a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, from Multan, who had uh, joined Timur when the uh, latter had invaded India in 1398, and he was rewarded by being appointed governor of Multan and Lahore in Punjab. And after Timur's departure from India and his death in 1405, the Tughlaq dynasty was critically weakened, and Kizar Khan was able to conquer Delhi in 1414, which finally brought the Tughlaq dynasty to an end. And in recognition of his uh, of being uh, uh, kind of ruling or serving the Timurids, he acknowledged them as his overlords and he sought recognition from Timur's son, Shah Rukh. And this, con this policy continued under Kizar Khan's son, Mubarak Shah. And uh, M Mubarak Shah, like the Tughlaqs before him, he also had to deal with numerous threats all around him, including rebellions in Punjab and Haryana, as well as the growing power of the Sultanate of Jompur. And by 13, uh, 1434, Mubarak would be assassinated at the instigation of his chief vizier, and he was succeeded by his nephew, Muhammad bin Farid, who was little interested in governing the Delhi Sultanate. And uh, unfortunately for him, his power was kind of growing, uh, was being overshadowed by the growing power of the Afghan nobility under their leader, Balul Lodi. And Mubarak's uh, son, Allah al-Din, would succeed Mubarak in 1445, but he wouldn't do much better, and he retired to Badan in Uttar Pradesh, abandoning Delhi to his chief vizier. And this this uh, move left um, left him vulnerable, 
and Bahlu Lodi uses opportunity to seize power, and he ended the Sayyid dynasty in 1451 AD. And uh, Sayyid dynasty coinage such as this are actually quite scarce, and they include kind of bronze such as this and gold coinage. And uh, Mubarak Shah's gold tankers, for example, consisted of inscriptions in Arabic on the reverse and the obverse. And on the obverse, it states Fi Ahad, Al Sultan, Al Ghazi, Al Mutawakil, Allah Al Rahman, Mubarak Shah, Sultan. Which means, uh, in the name of the one God, the Sultan and Holy Warrior, he who relies on God, the most merciful, Mubarak Shah, Sultan. And the reverse reads Fi Zaman Al Imam, Ami Al Muminin, Kulidat, Kilafatuhu which means in the name of the Imam, commander of the faithful, may God prolong his caliphate. And here is one of the gold uh, dunkers struck by Mubarak Shah of the Sayyid dynasty uh, between 1421 and 1434 AD in Delhi. And now we're going to look at the last of the Delhi Sultanate um, dynasties, the Lodis, and this is their territory at the peak of their rule. So you can see it stretched from uh, right up to from Peshawar right down to Bihar encompassing much of uh, North India, including Uttar Pradesh, of course, and Delhi. So, uh, Balu Lodi um, seized power in 1451, and he quickly moved to restore the power of the Delhi Sultanate. He gave many key government posts to his Afghan supporters, but uh, this caused a lot of resentment among the old nobility of Delhi. And some of these dis disaffected nobles invited the Sultan of Jaunpur, Mahmud Shah, to invade Delhi in 1452. And uh, as a result of this, um, Balu would be embroiled in war for uh, 27 years with the Sultanate of Jompo. And it didn't kind of come to its conclusion until 1479 when Balu conquered Jompo. And uh, Balu's son, Barbak, was made uh, governor of Jompo. And uh, by 1489, after, after a long time kind of campaigning, uh, you know, he, um, Balu Lodi had already fought across uh, Punjab, Rajasthan, and Sindh. But uh, his focus on Jompur and removing that threat from Delhi Sultanate uh, cost him control of Punjab. And um, his favor for the Afghans um, in his government uh, would alienate the Turks and Indian Muslims in his administration. And because of this, on the death of Balu, uh, despite his military his successes, he would leave a very kind of dangerous military and political situation for his son, Sikandar Lodi. And that is, uh, this is Sikandar Lodi's tomb, which can be seen today in Lodi Gardens in Delhi. It's been restored. Uh, Sikandar Lodi came to power on the 17th of July, uh, 1489, after a brief kind of power struggle with his brothers. And Sikandar had been governor of Delhi under his father, Balo. But, uh, his authority was still challenged by his brothers. Um, Alam Khan in Rapri, uh, Babak in Gombu, uh, Jompur, and Azam Humayun in Kalpi. And um, although he tried to avoid war, um, Sikandar did eventually triumph over his brothers and emerge as undisputed ruler of Delhi. And uh, after securing his position, Sikandar proceeded to conquer Bihar in the east and then focused on Gwalior. And in response to this, uh, his, particularly his campaign in, against Gwalior, he moved his capital from uh, Delhi to Agra. And it's from this time that a lot of the rulers, whoever would rule in North India, would have their capital in Agra. And this position of the capital would remain un, uh, until the Mughals moved the capital f uh, back to Delhi in 1639. So the status of Agra as capital of kind of Muslim kingdom in North India kind of dates back to the reign of Sikandar Lodi. But uh, despite Sikandar kind of re relocating down to Gwalior, he, he inadvertently kind of neglected the northwest provinces of the Delhi Sultanate. And this kind of neglect would have disastrous con consequences later on, as uh, later on um, th this would kind of greatly help the first Mughal Emperor Babur when he invaded India in 1526. But despite these, uh, these kind of setbacks and despite this, um, Sikandar is remembered as, as a successful ruler who presided over an efficient justice system and kept a tight control of his government. And uh, he died in 1517 
and uh, he's today buried in the Lodi Gardens in Delhi, as I mentioned before. And he was succeeded by his son, Ibrahim Lodi, the last of the Delhi Sultans. And uh, Ibrahim Lodi succeeded his father, Sikandar, on the 22nd of November, 1517 in Agra. The Sultan of Delhi had been divided with his brother Jalal, who proceeded to Jompur with the support from the nobility. But Ibrahim saw this for what it was, as a ploy to divide the Delhi Sultanate, and he sought to impose his authority. And he actually had a second coronation um, as Sultan on the 30th of December, 1517, and then proceeded to negotiate with Jalal. And despite some initial diplomatic successes, Jalal fled to Gwalior, and then uh, before fleeing on to the Gong Kingdom of Sangram Shah. And Sangram Shah would hand Jalal over to Ibrahim, who had him poisoned. And uh, Ibrahim's killing of his brother Jalal uh, provoked a lot of outrage and opposition from the nobility, who went on to rebel against his rule. And Ibrahim went on to crush um, their rebellion in, in the eastern lands of the Delhi Sultanate. But uh, his authority was undermined uh, much more, unfortunately, in 1523, when his brother, Dolat Khan Lodi, invited the Mughal Emperor Babu to invade India. And Ibrahim would face uh, Babu's armies on 21st of April 1526 in Panipat, which is today in Haryana, north of Delhi. And he would be defeated and killed. And after 300 years, with the death of Ibrahim Lodi, the Delhi Sultanate came to an end. And the Lodis uh, struck um, silver tankers, like before, with inscriptions in Arabic on the obvious and rivers. And these include silver tankers of Sikandar Lodi, which, uh, which have the following inscription on the obverse. Al-Mutawakil Allah Rahman Sikandar Shah Bahlul Shah Sultan. Which means uh, he who relies on God, the most merciful, Sikandar Shah, son of Bahlul Shah Sultan. And the reverse reads, Fi Zaman Ame Al Muminin Kulidat Kilafaturu. And then the calendar, yeah, written in, uh, in the Arabic calendar, 919 Hijri. Which, and this means, in the time of the caliph, uh, commander of the faithful, may God belong his caliphate. And then the Hijri year is, uh, can translate to 1513 to 1514 AD. And here's one of the silver tankers. Um, minted by Sikandar Shah in 919 Hijri, and no mint is given, but it's most likely it was struck in Delhi. Now I'm going to look at the Sultanate of Jompur, which uh, I believe at its peak um, would have, judging by its map, would have included um, Benares as well, and it's not that far uh, to get to. And um, the Jompur Sultanate um, was one of the successor states of Delhi Sultanate. And it was founded in uh, Jompur, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, in 1394 by Khaja Jahan, an East African slave minister of the Delhi Sultan, um, Nasiruddin Mohammed Tukluk. And uh, Khaja assumed the title of Sultan al Shak, which means Sultan of the East, and suppressed rebellions in Kanoj and um, Etawa in Uttar Pradesh. And he extended his power to encompass Karamanipur in Uttar Pradesh, uh, Avad, as well as parts of Bihar, where he waged war against the uh, Ujeniyas in Bhojpur. And he also enjoyed good relations with the Sultan of uh, the Sultanate of Bengal. And after his death in 1399, he was succeeded by his adopted son, uh, Mubarak Shah. And uh, Mubarak Shah of the Jompur Sultanate used the weakness of the Tulip dynasty to formally assert his independence. And um, But it would be under his brother, Shams, al-Din Ibrahim, that the Jompur Sultanate would reach its uh, greatest heights. And uh, under his rule, Ibrahim made Jompur a uh, notable center of learning, and it attracted scholars from Delhi. And Jompur was even known as Shiraz al-Shak, which means Shiraz of the East, because it was the center of Persian culture at the time. And a new architectural style um, developed in Jompur, which is known as Sharki style of architecture. And I've included a picture of a masjid that was built during that period. And you can see that it's really quite spectacular um, architecturally. This is in Jompur in Uttar Pradesh. And in addition to his architectural legacy, uh, Ibrahim was able to assert um, some military advantages and successes by conquering lands in Bihar 
and territory up to Kannauj in Uttar Pradesh, and he even threatened both the Delhi and Bengal Sultanates. But um, he was unable to hold on to Kannauj or conquer the, uh, the Bengal Sultanate. And Ibrahim died in 1440 and was succeeded by his son Mahmud Shah as Sultan of Jodhpur. And Mahmud Shah succeeded his father as Sultan of Jodhpur in 1440. And one of his campaigns, he conquered uh, Chunar Fort in Uttar Pradesh. But he was less successful in conquering Kalpi in Jalan district, Uttar Pradesh. And his reign saw further conflict with the Sultanate, Sultanate where he uh, clashed with Balu Lodi after attempting to conquer Delhi. And Mahmud Shah would die while his, his army was encamped um, to resist uh, Balu Lodi in capturing Shamshabad in Farukabad district in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, Mahmud Shah was succeeded by his son, Muhammad Shah, in 1457. And, and on acceding to the throne of John Poe in 1457, Muhammad Shah ended hostilities with Balu Lodi and ceded control over Shamshabad. But the killing of his brother, uh, Hassan Shah, prompted opposition from his nobility, and this led to a rebellion by his other brother, Hussein Shah, who proclaimed himself Sultan in John Poe. And Muhammad Shah was killed in battle with Hussein Shah and Kanaj and Hussein Shah would succeed him as Sultan of Jodhpur in 1458. And uh, initially in Hussein Shah's reign, there was peace between the Delhi and Jodhpur Sultanates, but they would soon both uh, come to war, and they would clash, and this war ended badly for the Jodhpur Sultanate. And Hussein Shah was forced to flee to the Sultanate of Bengal in 1479, when Jodhpur was conquered by Sikandar Lodi, and thus, after a brief period of just over a century, the John Paul Sultanate uh, came to an end. And uh, in addition to gold tankers, like the Tughlaqs had struck before them, the Sultans of John Paul uh, struck one-third silver and billion tankers, which were known as thir 32 Rati coins. So you can see the survival of the measuring system that I mentioned in my first lecture, the Rati. And these coins have uh, Arabic inscriptions on the obverse and reverse. The obverse reads, Ibrahim Shah al-Sultani Kulidat Mamlak Katuhu, which means Ibrahim Shah, the Sultan, may God prolong his kingdom. And the reverse reads, Al-Khalifa Ame al-Muminin Kulidat Kilafatuhu, which means the Caliph, commander of the faithful, may God prolong his caliphate. And here is one of those coins. This is a, a 32 rati or one third tanka coin struck by Ibrahim Shah uh, in the Jompo Sultanate, uh, most likely Jompo Mint between 1402 and 1440 AD. And now I'm going to look at um, the Sultan of Bengal, which is where the last of the Jompo Sultans had fled to. And this is the Bengal Sultanate at a maximum extent, um, kind of encompassing parts of Jharkhand, parts of Bihar, uh, parts of Odisha, and even down the Chitt Chittagong and parts of the Arakan, uh, Arakan coast, and north into Kuch Bihar, which borders kind of Nepal and Bhutan. So, um, as described in my previous lecture as well, uh, Bengal had long been a rebellious province, and by 1352, after numerous attempts, uh, Ilyas Shah would be the Sultan who would emerge as the first Beng uh, Bengal uh, Sultan. He had been the ruler of Sakdown and he came to power also, defeating his rivals for power, uh, Alauddin Ali Shah in Goa and Fakhru Uddin Mubarak Shah in Sonargaon. And his first capital was in Pandawa and he ruled over the entire Ganga and Brahmaputra deltas as well as parts of um, Bihar. And at its peak, his sultanate was stretched from Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh to Assam. But a lot of these gains were lost off his defeat by Frosha Tukluk, but he would remain as Sultan of Bengal. And Ilyas Shah is remembered uh, as the founder of the Ilyas Shahi dynasty of Bengal. And um, this is one of the architectural legacies of the Ilyas Shahis in Bengal. This is the Adina Masjid built in uh, Malda district in West Bengal, which, and it can still be seen today. And uh, in 1358 AD, uh, Ilyas Shah was succeeded by his son, Sikandar Shah. 
and Sikandar Shah was able to wage a successful war against the Delhi Sultanate and won political recognition from the Ferocia Tobluk. And Sikandar Shah is best remembered for building the Adila Mosque in Pandawa, which is one of the largest mosques in the Indian subcontinent. And his successor, Giyasuddin Azam Shah, was proactive in seeking diplomatic relations abroad with the Middle East as well as China and Southeast Asia. The resulting trade with these regions made the Bengal Sultanate very prosperous. And uh, Bengali also became patronized the language of literature, and it's the Bengali language is still renowned um, in this field. And um, the renown of Bengal was so considerable during this time that Azam Shah famously attempted to invite the Persian poet Hafiz um, to move from Shiraz to Bengal. And um, after that, there'd be brief uh, political turmoil. Um, so the Ilishai dynasty was challenged and overthrown by Jalaluddin Muhammad, the son of a Hindu ruler called Raja Ganesha. And uh, Jalaluddin had uh, overthrew the Ilya Shahis in 1415 and continued their policy of uh, developing diplomatic relations abroad. And he cultivated relations with the Timurids in Iran and Central Asia, as well as China. And he also further developed the uh, synthesis of Bengali Islamic architecture that was already uh, in, in the presence of developing at this time. And he even went as far as to proclaim himself caliph, also patronizing Brahmin scholars who wrote in, uh, in Bengali. So it's quite interesting. You have an Islamic ruler patronizing Brahmins to write in Bengali and Sanskrit. So it's quite an interesting synthesis going on in Bengal. Perhaps giving insight into the kind of secular nature, which is quite uh, very kind of present in Bengali culture. You can see aspects of that, even at this time, in my opinion. And after um, Jalaluddin's death, um, his, his son Shamsuddin Ahmad Shah came to power after the death of his father in 1433. And he continued his uh, father's policies in trade relations. But um, after his assassination by his servants Saadi and Nasir Khan, there was a, again a brief period of turmoil until the Ilya Shahi was restored to power. And the Ilya Shahis, um, when, after restoring their power, would rule from Badalpur in Bihar to Sulhet, in, which is now in Bangladesh. And the Ilya Shahis was, was able to defeat um, an invasion by the Kingdom of Assam, but eventually they would decline and be overthrown by East African palace guards led by Shahzada Babak. And now I'm going to talk about the Ilya Shahis uh, coinage. So they struck uh, silver tankers, similar to their contemporaries in Delhi Sultanate. But the reverse of the tankers under Shihab al-Din Bayezid had the octagonal design on the reverse. And the obverse and reverse of the tankers were written in Arabic. And the obverse says, uh, al muayyad bi'a bita'ayyayt, al-Rahman, Shihab al-Dunya wa al-Din. Abu Muzaffar Bayezid Shah al-Sultan, which means support of the favored and most merciful God, star of the world and faith, Father of the Victorious, Bayezid Shah, the Sultan. And reverse says, Nasser, Ame al muminin Got al-Islam wa al muslimin which means Nasir, commander of the faithful, help of Islam, and the Muslims. And this is one of the coins struck in Firozabad in the Bengal Sultanate by Shihab al-Din Bayezid between 1412 and 1414 in the Bengali Sultanate. And also going to look at uh, Raja Ganesh, uh, or Raja Ganesha, he's also known, who was the father of Sultan Aladdin. He briefly ruled as a king in, in his own right and struck silver tankas. And these coins, interestingly, are among the earliest coinage to be struck in Bengali. And the obverse reads, um, Shri Shri Danuju Madana Deva, which means Lord Danaju Madana Deva, which was the regnal title of Raja Ganesha. And the reverse reads Sri Chandi Charana Pa Rayana, which means uh, the disciple at the feet of the goddess Chandi. And this is one of the coins. So this perhaps one of the earliest examples of Bengali script as known. And this is struck by Raja Ganesha uh, between 1416 and 1418 AD in Chittagong. And um, now I'm going to move on to the Habshi dynasty of Bengal, which is uh, a very interesting dynasty because they were actually of East African descent. Uh, and they were founded by Shahzada Babak, 
who who overthrew the last of the Elia Shahi kings, Jalal bin Fateh Shah in 1487, and he had been in command of the palace guards and assumed the title Sultan Shahzada, which means uh, Sultan Prince. And he was killed after a few months by a former army commander of his, Saifuddin Farouz Shah. And Farouz Shah took the title of Sultan Al-Ahad, which means the first sultan. And he was a patron of uh, architecture in Bengal. And uh, his most visible architectural legacy today is the construction of the Ferozma Minar in Gore, in West Bengal. And he reigned until 1489. After Farouz Shah's death, the Habji dynasty was marked by instability. The last of the Habji dynasty, Sidi Badr, came to the throne in 1490 and assumed the title of Shamsuddin Muzaffar Shah. And um, Muzaffar Shah waged war against the Kamata kingdom in Assam, but soon had to face a threat from within his own kingdom. His vizier, Sayyid Hussein, led a campaign uh, of rebellion and overthrew Farouz Shah in 1494. And Sayyid Hussein took the title of Hussein Shah and established the Hussein Shahi dynasty in Bengal. And with this, the Habshi dynasty came to an end. And um, upon, upon his succession uh, to the throne, Hussein Shah oversaw, uh, oversaw renewal in the patronage of Bengali culture. And um, he also conquered Odisha and lands up to Chittagong, where he encountered the Portuguese for the first time. And in 14, uh, 1519, he was succeeded by his son, Nazuddin Nusrat Shah, who sheltered Afghan refugees who were fleeing uh, Baba's defeat of the Lodi dynasty. He further patronized Bengali literature while ensuring that the Mughals didn't invade Bengal, despite being defeated by them at the Gagra River in 1529. And the last Husayshahi ruler, Mahmud Shah, was overthrown by the Suri dynasty in 1538. And uh, Nusra Shah is known for his um, coinage, which had uh, line countermarks. And um, these line countermarks were left by bankers. And some of these countermarks um, are more complete. And these include the name of the bankers, such as Ram, Vijaya, or Mahananda. And these countermarks are also sometimes known as shroffs. And here is uh, one of those coins. You can see the line countermark here. This is struck by Nusra Shah of the Hussein Sahih dynasty in the Bengal Sultanate between 1519 and 1531 AD. Now I'm going to look at the Muhammad Shahi dynasty, uh, which came to power after the decline of the, the Suri dynasty. Uh, so the so the Muhammad Shahi dynasty was founded by Muhammad Khan Suri, who uh, who rebelled against Islam Shah Suri, who is the successor of Shah Suri. And once again, the Bengal Sultanate emerged independent, and Muhammad Khan Shuri stylized himself as Muhammad Shah. And uh, Muhammad Shah moved to conquer Chittagong and the Arakan coast in Myanmar, or Burma. And he then proceeded to challenge the Suri dynasty directly by conquering Jonpur with the intention of marching on Delhi. But uh, Muhammad Shah was killed in battle with Adil Shah's, uh, Shuri's famous general, uh, Hemu Vikramditya, at Chapagata in Uttar Pradesh in 1555 AD. And the Muhammad Shah dynasty continued to rule in Bengal until its last ruler, Diyasuddin Bahadur Shah III, was assassinated in 1564. And the Pathan ruler, uh, Taj Khan, took ruler in 1564 and founded the Karani dynasty. And with this, this Hussein Shahi dynasty came to an end. And Diyasuddin Bahadur Shah, uh, one, of the, one of the rulers of the dynasty, um, he served as viceroy initially um, for his father, Gyasuddin Bahadur Shah I, and he minted silver tankers of a lower weight in Chittagong. And this was done to facilitate trade. Uh, a lot of it was with the Portuguese, who had established a presence in India by this time. And normally um, tankers would weigh about 11 grams, but these trade tankers were, were struck at a weight of 10 grams. And these coins have Arabic inscriptions on them. And the verse reads um, in Arabic, Bahadur Shah Sultan bin Muhammad Shah Sultan, Khalada Allah Mulkahu wa Sultanahu, which means Bahadur Shah Sultan, son of Muhammad Shah Sultan, may God prolong his kingdom and sultanate. And the reverse includes the following inscriptions in Arabic, Al Sultan bin Al Sultan, which means the Sultan, son of the Sultan. And here's one of the coins struck by uh, Gyasuddin Bahadur of the Hushin Zahid dynasty, um, struck in 959 Hijri, 
which is about 1551 to 1552 AD, Jitta government. <coughs> the last uh, dynasty of the Bengal Sultanate, the Karani dynasty, uh, came to power in 1564, when it was founded by Taj Khan. And uh, Taj Khan had uh, formerly sh uh, served Shah Shah Suri and went on to, to declare himself uh, Sultan of Bengal after the end of the Muhammad Shahi dynasty. And his initial capital was Gaul, before shifting it to Tanda, near Molda, in West Bengal. And his successor, Suleiman Khan, conquered Odisha. But his successor, Daud Khan, would lose Mufti's conquest of the Mughals under Akbar. And the Karai dynasty would finally formally come to an end when it was dissolved by Jahangir, Akbar's son, in 1612. And with this, the Bengal Sultanate and his remnant finally came to an end. Now I'm going to look at the Babanis, uh, the most powerful kind of Muslim kingdom that emerged in the wake of the collapse of the Delhi Sultanate in the south of India. We see that they boarded the Vidyanaga Empire, which was their main adversary in the south of India, and their capital was in Karnataka. The capital, sorry, was in um, Tilangana in Hyderabad, and they also ruled over parts of Karnataka. The Bahmani Sultanate was founded by Hassan Gangu, who rebelled against Muhammad in Tughluq in 1347. And uh, he became known, after seizing power, as Sultan Allah al-Din, or Sultan of the Faith. And he called himself Bahman because he claimed descent from the ancient, ancient Persian king, Bahman, from the Shah Nameh. And he ruled from Hassanabad, which is now known as Gulbarga, or Kalaburagi, which is his official name, in Karnataka. And his death in 1358 would lead to a period of instability. And here is one of the structures built by the Bamanis, the Haft Gumbas in Gulbarga in Karnataka. Um, and this, the instability that I described, would come to an end when Taj Uddin Feroz Shah took power in 1397. Apologies for the typo above. Um, much of his uh, reign was spent fighting the powerful Vijayanaga Empire which was centered on Hampi in Karnataka. And these wars, wars would be inconclusive. And after his death, in 1422, the capital of the Bamani Sultanate would be shifted to Bidar in Karnataka in 1429 AD. And after this, um, there was again a period of instability until Muhammad Shah III came to power. And under Muhammad Shah III, the, Bama, the Bamani Sultanate grew to its greatest extent. And after his death in 1482, the Bamani Sultanate's decline would resume before finally fragmenting into five Sultanates uh, in Bidar, Berar, uh, Bijapur, Golconda, and Atmandagar. And uh, Bamani coinage um, included kind of silver, uh, silver tankas um, and uh, ghanis, in, which were minted in Hassanabad and later in Bidar, uh, which were both in uh, Karnataka. And um, they also struck uh, half pesos during the reign of Tajuddin Feroz Shah. Uh, this is a silver tanker of Tajuddin Feroz Shah. And uh, these coins have inscriptions in Persian on the obverse and, and Arabic on the reverse. And the obverse says Feroz Shah. Um, and then the reverse says Al Sultan, which means the Sultan. And here is a, the half pesa of uh, Tajuddin Feroz Shah of the Bahmani Sultanate. Um, probably struck in Gulbaga uh, between 1397 and 1422 AD. And now I'm going to look at the last, um, this is the last Sultanate I'm going to talk about in my talk, the, the Sultanate of Gujarat, here in the western part of India. So the Gujarat Sultanate came to power when Muzaffar Khan declared independence from the Delhi Sultanate in 1407. He took the title of uh, Sultan Muzaffar Shah I. And his capital was in Patan in Gujarat. And uh, this would remain the capital until his successor, Ahmed Shah I, founded the city of um, Ahmedabad in Gujarat, which is still um, the biggest, I believe, the biggest city in Gujarat. And this was founded in 1411. And Ahmedabad was known as Shah e Azam, Mu Muazam, sorry, the great city. Uh, this perhaps giving an indication that it was already a very big city by this time. And this, this, uh, would, would resume again in modern times. And uh, Ahmed Shah would, um, after coming to power, would deal with rebellions. Uh, and then after crushing those rebellions, he invaded Khandesh and Maharashtra, as well as Malwa and Madhya Pradesh. 
And he also waged war against the Bahmani Sultanate in the south and was able to conquer some territory, including Thana and Mahim in the Maharashtra. And Ahmed Shah would die in 1443 and be succeeded by uh, Muhammad Shah II. And Muhammad Shah would wage war against Idar in Gujarat and uh, Bungapur in Rajasthan. And he made both of these kingdoms tributaries. But uh, on, unfortunately, on his return from his campaign against uh, Champana in Gujarat, he died. And Muhammad Shah II was succeeded by uh, Ahmed Shah II, who would launch uh, new campaigns of conquest by conquering Kapat Banj in Gujarat. But after dying in 1458, um, there would be renewed instability in the Gujarat Sultanate, uh, which would continue until Mahmud Begada would take power and conquer Garna and Champana in Gujarat. But after Mahmud uh, Begada's death in 1511, his successor, Muzaffar Shah II, would face a serious threat from Rana Sangha um, of Mewa in Rajasthan. And Rana Sangha defeated and plundered the Gujarat Sultanate. And Northern Gujarat was also annexed by Rana Sangha. But upon his death in 1528, the Gujarat Sultanate power would be restored under Bahadur Shah I. And it was Bahadur Shah I um, who would uh, be the first Gujarat Sultan to clash with the Portuguese and Mughals. Um, he, he initiated a campaign again of renewed expansion and there were military expeditions undertaken against the neighbors of the Gujarat Sultanate. But uh, he would have to deal with kind of two threats, the Mughal Empire in the north under Humayun, the son of Baba, and the Portuguese who had arrived uh, on the coast of the Arabian Sea. And Bahadur Shah would briefly lose kingdom to Humayun before regaining it again in 1526. Didn't type it there. Unfortunately, it would be the Portuguese who would ultimately kill him in 1536, thus ending his reign. Sorry for the wrong year here. And um, this is kind of an architectural motive from the Gujarat Sultanate, just to illustrate the kind of rich cultural patronage that happened uh, in, the Guj in the Gujarat Sultanate at this time. And after the death of Bahadur Shah I, uh, there would be instability in the Gujarat Sultanate. And the Gujarat Sultanate would ultimately have to face its greatest threat from the Mughal Emperor, uh, the Mughal Empire during the reign of Akbar in 1572. And after a final rebellion by the last Sultan of Gujarat, Muzaffar Shah III, um, in 1529, the Gujarat Sultanate would finally come to an end when he died. And the Gujarat Sultanate formally came to an end by that time. And um, the coinage of the Gujarat Sultanate was again kind of tankas, and among these denominations was the one-fourth tankas minted by Mahmud Shah I. And these had uh, inscriptions in Arabic. The obverse um, reads Al-Sultan Al-Azam, Nasi Al-Dunya Wa Al-Din, Abul Fat the great, which means the great sultan, the one who gives victory to the world and faith, father of victory. And the reverse reads, Mahmud Shah al-Sultan, which means Mahmud Shah the sultan. And this is one of the coins. Uh, this was struck in uh, Mustafa Abad mint in Gujarat between 1458 and 1511 under Mahmud Shah, the first of the Gujarat Sultanate. And on a note, uh, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have covered in a brief time, I should say. One hour is comparatively a brief time when yeah. you cover all the municipalities and the provinces during the Sultanate period and beyond that up to even the period of Akbar and Jahagir. So, really it was very nice presentation and we all just were benefited by the, the, the presentation you did and uh, as far as the uh, questions are concerned, uh, we would like to know as to uh, the element of uh, something like continuity or element of similarities among the coins of different principalities or provinces. Do you find something like a commonality? Uh, we, we hear or we read, we read that uh, the issuing of the coin is something like a symbol of the sovereign. 
if you are a sovereign, then it is something like an attribute of a sovereign that you should have coins. And from that very viewpoint, we find that even the smaller level of the the rulers, if, 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 if I'm not using the word rulers, even the zamindars or some rajas who were of small dimension, they also issued the the coins. So uh, the coins were something like a, a a symptom or a representation of the royalty or the uh, I should say the the sovereignty. So uh, as some coins you mentioned having the inscription Persian inscription, the late some of the coins you mentioned Persian, and earlier the coins were mainly inscribed in Arabic. So do you find anything, a relationship or something like an explanation for uh, Persian coins to, to the Persian inscriptions and writings on the coins? And again to repeat, what do you think is something like a continuity, element of continuity and commonality among the coins issued during the uh, Sultanate period and just beyond that? Please. Yeah, so to answer your first question, the emergence of Persian culture, I mean, uh, Persian scriptures on the coins is a reflection of the kind of Persian element that always existed among the Muslim kind of kingdoms and sultanates that existed in the Delhi, in, across North India and right down the south. So it was kind of inevitable that Persian would kind of emerge because, because, uh, because despite kind of, you know, in religious kind of aspects, you know, Arabic was the language used, but in terms of administration, Persian was the language that was used. So I think it was, it just reflected that reality at court that Persian was used by the rulers. And about the second, um, about the second uh, question, I mean, there's a lot of similarity. Like, if you if you compare, like, this is a tank of uh, Alauddin Kilji that struck in Delhi, and then this is a later tank uh, of the Bamanis, and then this is another tank of the Habshi dynasty. So you see that they follow the same template, you know, with the Arabic or Persian on either side. So the, you can see definitely as you see them, you can see the similarities. You know, they're round pieces of silver, similar weights, and you can see that. Um, and that they're very similar. And I think it's just because it may have also been kind of just um, expedient or just convenient because they had this template that they could use and also made it easier as well for um, merchants or, you know, bankers to accept the coin because, you know, like in, in India, so this, again, it's going back to a point I've made, I think, before as well, but I think it kind of very relevant even now is that, um, even up to present, is that the acceptance of coinage by the bankers, the money lenders, was a big issue for all, all kings, going back to ancient times, down to the medieval, the Islamic period, right down to the British and into present times, that, you know, you want to make people accept the coins, so you want to make a coin that is, you know, similar, there's not much change, so the weight is standardized, the type is standardized, so it would make sense for whoever came to power, they want to obviously say that, you know, I'm the Sultan, uh, appointed by God, but at the same time, they want to make, make sure that the coin, there's not much to too much disruption or change, so then, you know, for the merchants and money lenders, which are kind of the engines of the economy, they could accept the coins and use them, and then the economic kind of machinery could continue as before. Uh, yes, now I uh, invite the honorable audience to come up with the queries or some observations. There are students, I guess, uh, if they have any question, they may come up with their questions and queries uh, about the coins of the medieval India and whatever Azim Ali Sahab, Dr. Azim Ali has said, if someone has to say something in the form of observation or question, you are welcome. I think we are not uh, responding, but uh, I think this would be the last question which I am going to ask you. Uh, the, the monetization of the Indian economy in medieval period has been described by historians that it has increased 
with the arrival of the uh, rulers from the Islamic background, some revolution took place in agriculture, like in the form of the some new instruments were used for agrarian uh, uh, irrigation activities, which were uh, imported from Iran, uh, like they call it Rahat. The, yeah. the, so, so, this is something like a question which other historians, they, 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 they try to answer, like Professor um, uh, some professor from, I am forgetting the name, and she is very much friendly to me, professor from Aligarh University, who has done work uh, uh, the monetization of the medieval economy. Uh, so, how do you think uh, there is any reflection in the form of the quantum of coins we receive in certain dynasties? More and more coins are there. It is also something like a reflection of the commercialization of the Indian economy. More and more commercial activities. And more and more, uh, I should say, monetization of the... Uh, yes, I have remembered her name. She is Professor Shirin Musli. And also Professor Infan Habib has also written oh, yeah, about he's... the monetization of the economy during the medieval period. And some historians have described something like a revolution in the economic history of India to the 13th century onwards. And some historians say that prior to that, even during the Rajput period, there was something like flourishing. But there are controversies. So by pinpointedly, I would like to ask and know your view. How do you see the 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 the, the circulation of the, the the coins and the increase in the uh, economic activities in India? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so so um, yeah, it's a really good question. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, I mean, at at the time you had increased. Um, I mean, uh, historians. You talk about the phases of urbanization that happened in India. So the Delhi Sultanate, um, this, this period and the successor states comprises the kind of third period of urbanization. So you had the third, so you had a kind of growth of kind of small towns across India as, uh, and new cities being founded as, you know, there's more merchant activity happening. Trade routes were, were being secured. Money was moving around. So people started building towns and cities. So there was kind of renewed sense of prosperity. And to kind of pave the way for my next talk, which I will be covering on the moguls, like a lot of the mints that we see being established would be kind of continued under the moguls. So you start seeing a lot of the mints that we're going to see later on kind of re kind of uh, continuing. And, um, and, and yes, the, the prosperity at this time is quite, uh, is also kind of marked with uh, also the linking of India. Once again, I think, I believe for the first time, yeah, actually for the first time since ancient times, once again, India is kind of integrated into kind of a wider, um, I wouldn't say quite global, but international economy at this time. So in ancient times, particularly in the Mauryans, the Kushan, the Guptas, India had kind of become, because it was stable and united, and North India is relatively united, it became tied in with kind of trade with the rest of kind of the neighbors to the west and neighbors to the east. So once again on the Delhi Sultanate, and even, even when it fragmented, you see kind of India again kind of building this, re reconnecting with their neighbors to the east and west, and it became and made India very prosperous. And this again will continue under the uh, under the Mughals, and um, and also in the 16th century, as evidence of that, you start seeing um, this is kind of going to the Mughal era, but also overlapping with the Sultanate period, the late kind of Sultanates that emerged. Um, you start seeing um, silver bullion uh, flowing into India, which again made the town cities very prosperous, and a lot of the silver, um, particularly during the reign of Akbar. So it's kind of moving ahead a bit, but a lot of the silver would came, come from the Americas, which would be conquered by the Spanish. And the Portuguese would bring the silver into India, and, and this silver would be struck as coinage. And this made India very prosperous. So one of the drivers of urbanization was kind of the flow of silver, first kind of from the West, because in, I, I believe that because silver, a lot, of, a lot of time in Indian history, silver has had to be imported. So initially, a lot of the silver would have been imported from mines um, kind of west of India, such as in Afghanistan, and these would have been struck as um, as coinage under the sultans. And then later on, at the, at the other end of the sultanate period, a lot of silver came from the New World, 
and that would be minted as coinage. So I think the integration of in, in integration of India into a kind of global economy, um, you could see kind of that kind of emerging at this time because the moguls Remish continue this policy of kind of trading with their neighbours. So again, I think um, I think one can trace that to this kind of sultanate period, despite it being so fragmented. So um, I hope that answered your question because um, I feel it's more of a global. There's a global dimension as well, like a, or a kind of international dimension, I should say. Thank you very much for enlightening on these issues. And uh, I request uh, uh, Alok. Alok, can you hear me? Can Are you hear? there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, before Alok comes up with the proposal uh, for the vote of thanks, uh, and just uh, uh, yes, I, I express my thanks to the audience and to the to our honourable speaker, Dr. Azim Ali Khan, Azim Ali Sahab, sorry, Khan, Azim Ali Sahab, and uh, I, I place my request that it would be very much uh, desirable that if we could continue with the uh, next level of his lecture on the points of Mughal India and the message they communicate and the message they tell to the modern period to the contemporary India, like that. And it is really something uh, very good and uh, really very good uh, appeared uh, or concluded that, of course, the Indian economy was getting integrated despite different uh, strategies and things like that. Because of the commerce and the, the points, the Indian economy as such was integrated and that was something like when we come to the beginning of the 18th century, then some of the historians, they say that India and China were the top economies of the world in the beginning of the 18th century. Yeah. Uh, so I think these things also should be uh, analyzed in terms of the points. So I invite uh, Alokji to come up with his views uh, regarding the expressing thanks for Dr. Azim Ali and the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving this uh, valuable opportunity and uh, thank you so much uh, for everyone for participating in this lecture and making very it meaningful and I thank uh, uh, Sabil Kalam sir and uh, I thank his speaker honorable Ajay Mali sir and for this giving valuable and uh, valuable time and speaking very meaningful and for understanding the great heritage of India. Thank you sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.